Welcome to tonight's Together Though Apart conversation. It's good to see everyone here this evening. Um, if you're just now joining us, go ahead and be um, pulling up a chair, get you something to drink, some coffee or something or another like that. And um, be sure to go ahead and let me know where you are from. And if you are here, just uh, put a comment there in the Facebook comment area or if you're watching us through YouTube, drop that into the YouTube comment area as well. That way we kind of know who all is with us tonight as we go through our conversation this evening. Well, we've heard some interesting news today. Um, and in a couple minutes, we'll, uh, we'll have a guest that we'll bring on that will kind of help update some of the, the uh, figures and information and so forth that we're having to deal with. Um, but... It was a very beautiful day outside. Went outside, uh, went over to the building, was outside and recording some videos for Sunday's rock class. And they're at the pond and it'll be prettier once everything decides to go uh, green as we go through these uh, spring months and everything. But looking good though, very nice outside. Uh, you can all, and in just a moment, I'll um, bring up how you can go ahead and begin to participate in the conversation tonight if you would like to do that. Uh, we have several different ways. I've already mentioned two of them, both with Facebook and YouTube. But you can also uh, send me a text message. Uh, the phone number for that text message, if you would like to send it in or call and leave a voicemail, and I'll play the voicemail online. But that number is seven is 405-726-0874. 405-726-0804. So I mentioned to you that we have two guests that are going to be coming on this evening. Um, in a little bit, we're going to have uh, Jesse explain to us. You know what? I'm, I'm going to turn it around real quick because Paul is outside, and the sun is going down. And right now, he looks good, but I can't guarantee that he will continue to look good. So, Jesse, if you'll hang out in the green room there for a little bit. Uh, Paul, if you'll unmute yourself, I will um, introduce you to everybody, and then you can go right ahead with um, bringing in. The one thing I failed to do, Paul, is to set us up a side-by-side -side. So I'll just have you right there. So you, you okay. tell everybody, if you would, where you live, uh, who you are, what you do, and how this current situation is uh, affecting y'all. Certainly. Uh, my name is Paul Adams. Uh, I work with the Church of Christ in Ellettsville, Indiana. And we live very close to Ellettsville. We actually have a Bloomington address. Bloomington is where Indiana University is. And so uh, it's sort of a diverse population around here. And so... Uh, that's about me. Um, so, okay, how long have y'all been feeling, if you would, in general? Um, how quick, we, do you remember how quick your governor was to jump on the bandwagon of we need to basically shelter in place type thing? Sure. Uh, he was not one of the first uh, by far. In fact, we kind of been anticipating something happening. Uh, but I, I had made a few notes here. Uh, I think it was on... Uh, this past Wednesday, uh, when when our governor, Governor Holcomb, uh, issued the um, stay-at-home order, he called it, and it's an executive order from the governor's office, and he says that's going to run at least through April the 7th. Now, I've heard some medical reports recently that indicate that uh, this may peak uh, after that, and I don't know what the decision will be, but he let, it, let us know that it would be at least through April the 7th. So that's a two week or, or maybe it's 15 days period of time in which uh, the order is to stay at home. But I will say that here in Indiana, the, the definition of essential personnel that can go out is pretty wide. Uh, there are a lot of people who can can go out, those who work at restaurants, those who work in grocery stores, uh, warehouse type people, truck drivers. Uh, if in any way you're involved with public safety. Uh, and, and all of that, there, there's just a, a lot of people that can go out and can do the things uh, that they normally do, at, at least as far as going to their job. 
Uh, but for those who don't fit in one of those categories, the order from the governor is to stay at home. Um, our local governor put a 21 day order in effect that only just a few days ago, if, if memory serves, um, he was a little bit delayed as well, you know. And what it, I think what it was is that he had a threshold that he was watching for. Uh, he was interviewed on the local news agency, um, I think it was KOCO on a Monday, and uh, they tried to get him to tell him what's the threshold. And he says, no, we, we, you know, we'll, we'll keep going on everything. You know, if we have to, we have to. And then, like two days later, you know, it was, you know, as of Wednesday night, all unnecessary shops will shut down, you know, shelter in place and things like that. Yeah, you know, we have uh, we have the ability to go out uh, if we need groceries or something from the pharmacy, something that's considered essential. Uh, even if you don't have an essential job, uh, you're able to do that. There's not that kind of uh, restriction that, that's so heavy. Uh, I do know that the employers have been providing letters uh, to the employees that are considered essential. So that if there should be any question, they can show that. And I actually talked to some of our local law enforcement uh, within this area. Uh, the Ellettsville area, and his anticipation would be that if I needed to go to the church building, say, to record a Bible class uh, or for one of our live streams, well, we're not meeting right now, that I would not be bothered or hindered in any way from doing that. Okay, so he would, you could still persist with that. Um, how many, how many cases are there confirmed in uh, Indiana now, Paul? Well, it's interesting that you asked that. I was looking that up here because this morning uh, a new report was released uh, just this morning. And as of this morning, there were 645 confirmed cases of the COVID-19 in the state, and there have been 17 deaths. Now, that number may be a little bit skewed because uh, Indiana was not doing any testing uh, during the early part of this. And so it really didn't matter how uh, sick you were or anything else. I mean, they would treat the symptoms, they would treat whatever they needed to do, but they didn't run tests uh, except in very rare instances. And so probably the number is, has been a little higher than that. Uh, and we recently, be, being a university area with Indiana University, we recently had the students return and uh, from spring break and families return from spring break and while Indiana University is shutting down, students still need to come get some of their things. And the concern is places they have been, they may have brought this back uh, to our area as well. And so we may see a peak yeah. uh, in a few weeks. Okay. All right, well, um, that is very interesting to know. And of course, the, the church up there in Indiana is faced with the same challenges that we all are, same limitations there. All right. Well, yeah, um, thing. I, I serve yeah. as well as the evangelist, one of the elders here, and we have four elders. And for us to make a decision uh, not to have services is really uh, troubling. And so as as I think about that, you know, it's uh, we, we're doing online things. We're, we're trying to keep people informed and encouraged and built up and all of that. But it was a very difficult thing for us to make a decision not to uh, not to meet for regular services, and we are anxious to resume those services just as soon as possible. Yeah, I agree completely, I agree. All right, well, let's see, I'm looking real quick. We had a comment and I haven't found it yet, so bear with me here just a second, y'all. Um, While you do that, I was just gonna say, I didn't think I would lose daylight quite this quick, but I can tell it's getting darker and darker. I'll stay on as long as I can, but at some point, <laughs> Before the hour's up, I'll probably run out of daylight. That's funny. That it's I had I didn't even think about that happening, but yeah. I didn't oh. either. All right, <laughs> let's see. All right. Well, I'll tell you what, Paul, we will go ahead and say bye to you. I appreciate you joining us tonight, kind of giving us a, a little preview of, of what y'all were looking at. And um, yeah, okay, we do have a couple of comments. Finally my, my program here has updated and uh, Mike you know, Paul, of course, no, Mike. Paul, where does Mike live in relation to you real quick? He works with the Church of Christ in Orleans, and I'm thinking he lives down in the Pinhook area, but he works with the, and that's uh, some small communities in, in uh, southern Indiana, and I believe he works with the church in Orleans, Indiana. 
Uh, they're in, in Lawrence, Lawrence, Lawrence County. That's right. Yeah. Um, he says that they, they have one confirmed there, apparently, in Lawrence County as well. He was in Monroe County, where I live as well, but not, okay. not any large numbers just yet. I saw a report from a, a friend who's a nurse, and our hospital, our local hospital, is gearing up for uh, a 300% increase over the next two to three weeks. Oh, wow. That is, that is something else. And that's probably, as they say, with an abundance of caution. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Paul. Hey. I appreciate it very much, and um, you hang in there, and we will talk to you a little bit later on here. Well, I apologize for the poor quality of the video. I probably should sign off, but thanks for the opportunity to share what's going on here in Indiana. Mike might have some uh, thoughts in, in the chat that he provides uh, to tell you more about what's going on. So, Okay. All right. You guys appreciate take care. It. Stay safe and stay strong. Thanks, Paul. You do the same. All right. Bye-bye. So there you have it, that Paul, um, just kind of sharing with this information that they have going on up there. And, and Mike Davis, who is in the chat room, as Paul said, lives there in Indiana. And um, I know some other preachers throughout the country, as we go through various nights, I'll see if they want to pop in and kind of describe how things are going there. But, but let me tell you about a conversation I had um, some probably a couple weeks back. So I'd been watching, just as you had, all the news programs and everybody saying, if you'll do this, you know, you'll stop the virus, if we can all just do this and everything. And they really painted the picture as if the virus could be halted, that it could be brought to an end, that you know, we, you know, if you did this, we wouldn't have to sweat it. And, and, and my thoughts were, well, I don't quite understand it. It's going to stay around no matter what. It's not like it's going to die out on us and go away and we will never ever see that again. So I quite understand, you know, what, in other words, why do the social distancing? Because we're going to get it anyway. So I called, uh, I called one of our members, Jesse Kemp, and uh, I'm going to bring him on. And Jesse, if, if you don't mind, you don't have to be overly specific, but I'll have you to, to let everybody know kind of what you do for a living, you know, where your field of expertise is. And um, he's going to, he, he will explain the importance behind the social distancing, um, kind of in the way that he explained it to me. And, and it, it helped. And I know they've done it on the news show. They brought in doctors and stuff, but it helped to hear it from someone that I knew. So, um, Jesse, I think you've unmuted yourself. So I'll go ahead and, and turn it over to you, sir. Hi, everyone. Uh, basically, uh, John asked me to provide a little bit of information about uh, what social distancing is and, and kind of why we're doing it. Now, big qualification here, I am not a medical doctor. Uh, my background is actually toxicology, but I do have uh, quite a bit of interaction with immunology, which is an uh, important field for uh, studying how our immune systems react to viruses and things of that nature. So uh, if you'll bring up that first slide for me, Kelvin. So this is a typical slide that you've seen probably going around uh, on the news. Uh, this is actually Oklahoma's slide here. And basically it kind of describes what social distancing is, maintaining distance uh, between people and maintaining uh, lower groups of people. So uh, congregations and pretty much anywhere work, uh, you're trying to limit the spread of the virus by social distancing. You're trying to create enough room between you and other people so that the transfer does not uh, continually uh, foster itself and keep spreading. And so they're doing certain things. They're asking you to stay away from people, maintain six feet of distance, not gather in groups of greater than, than 10. Uh, a lot of team sports and things like that have been canceled. Large gatherings have been canceled, such as concerts, um, things of that nature. Uh, they're emphasizing a lot of typically good hygiene type things that you would do to uh, prevent it. Uh, keep your hands away from your face, uh, wash your hands frequently, use hand sanitizer, those types of things. Um, go ahead and pull up the, the next slide for me if you would. The reason we're trying to do this is because this is a very contagious uh, virus. It's easily spread from person to person, and it can even be spread possibly without showing symptoms. 
So an individual could potentially have that, that virus and be spreading it without showing symptomology or being showing very mild symptoms. Um, it could even possibly spread from contaminated surfaces. Now, most of that spread is gonna be happening between person to person, but those other entities can happen. So the graph we have here is the reason we're doing social distancing and everybody's probably looking at the graph going, oh, I feel like I'm back in school. This is a simple graph, we'll take care of it. The, the bottom axis, what you see going from left to right there is, is time. It says time since the first case. Your other axis going up and down is the number of cases. So you see uh, another line there that goes across the middle that's called healthcare system capacity. That's essentially what our healthcare system can, can do. That can be envisioned as the total number of hospital beds that we have, the total number of hospital uh, and emergency personnel that we have, the total number of ventilators that we have, um, gloves, masks, things of that nature. So that's our capacity. Anything below that is manageable. Anything above that, we're exceeding the capacity and decisions have to be made uh, about how someone would be cared for. Uh, you see a nice, big, tall uh, red peak there. It says, without protective measures. So if we let this virus spread unabated, uh, basically what we would see is we'd see a rapid uh, increase in the number of positive cases in a very short period of time. And we would exceed that healthcare system capacity very rapidly and very difficult decisions would have to be made. Uh, decisions that uh, we are unfortunately seeing in other countries such as Italy and Spain where Certain individuals who have a less uh, probability of survival are not getting the care that they need because they have to make a difficult decision about who's gonna get access to that hospital bed, who's gonna get access to that respirator. Um, and so what we're trying to do is, you've probably seen the term flatten the curve. So what they're trying to do is turn that nice, big, sharp red peak, and they're trying to squash it and squish it into this nice little blue peak here so that we can spread it out over time. So that you still get the same number of cases maybe happening, but they happen over a much longer period of time and they don't breach that level of our health healthcare system capacity. So that's the idea behind uh, trying to uh, social distance and, and keep each other safe by not spreading that virus. Uh, if you will go to that, that next slide for me. So on this slide, this is actually Oklahoma data, uh, but there's a number of data out there. You can find data on the US as a whole. You can find data uh, across the world so you can get global data. But in Oklahoma, this is data that, that goes up to today. What we're seeing is a steady increase of positive cases. So you have dates along the bottom and your, your number of positive cases uh, in those blue bars. And what you're seeing is you're seeing a, a kind of a flat uh, curve there at the very beginning, and then you start seeing it stair step up, and then you start seeing it increase pretty rapidly. So 50% increases, 60% increases. And so our curve is starting to look more like the red curve than the blue curve, which is concerning. What we want to do is maintain that social distancing. And so uh, if people will adhere to that, if they'll be responsive to it, we can flatten that curve out. We can reduce those number of cases. Uh, if you will, hit that last slide as well. So these are good reference points. Don't take my word for it, as they say. Go to the most appropriate, most up-to-date information. So what I did is I gave three different uh, links. There's one for the World Health Organization. They're going to give you a global perspective. So you get to see the big picture. And then we have the CDC, which is going to be for the United States. So that we're getting a little bit smaller, more concentrated about us. And then finally, the Oklahoma State Department of Health. They're going to have the most relevant data for us in Oklahoma so that we can make uh, the best local decisions that we can make. So the governor is probably looking at both the CDC data as well as the Oklahoma data to help guide and inform his decisions about when to relax these restrictions or if he sees the, the data going in the wrong direction, he may increase the restrictions so that we have even less contact, even less spread. But the overall goal is to try and uh, 
slow the spread of the virus. And if we would, if we would strictly adhere to it, you might even see decreases in the spread of that virus. So that's the goal right now is not to breach uh, that capacity. Um, it's really just about buying time so that we don't exceed our healthcare capacity. Unfortunately, I think what we're gonna see here in the next few days with New York and possibly others that are gonna be following suit is they're going to start exceeding that capacity. They're going to start, the patients that they have are gonna start outnumbering the number of hospital beds that they have. And so you'll start seeing them employ other measures. They may open up hotels or convention centers or, or other places for temporary housing facilities for those that are infected. And we don't wanna see that here. So my encouragement is for all of us to just kind of grin and bear it. I know it's not optimum uh, to be missing on services and be missing work and, and all these things. They're very troublesome. They're very hard to do, but they're, they're there to keep us safe and to keep our, our brethren safe as well. You know, Jesse, I, I appreciate that. And stay stay on the screen there. I will, or stay in the Zoom room. Got a couple of conversations kind of thinking about this. Um, so I just, I read earlier and you, and you said you'd confirm this. How do we, our total number of cases now compare to the total number of cases in China? So it sounds like just today, the United States exceeded the case number that's in China. Part of that is probably due to increased testing, but part of it is also due to increased spread here. China may have been able to clamp down on it a little bit tighter and a little bit quicker than we did. I'm not sure. Yeah. But the fact of the matter is we have significant spread of the virus, especially in urban population centers, but that will slowly start trickling out into rural centers as well. Well, and, and the article I was reading also pointed out that we don't know who China tests and doesn't test. Exactly. Yeah. So with the United States, we kind of were a little slow to get our testing up and running. A lot of it was because of the ability of the reagents to do the testing. Now they've, they've kind of fixed that loophole. We're starting to get a lot more tests available. So they're starting to do a lot more testing. So we will see those numbers increase probably for the next several weeks. Do you think it's possible that in, in the months to come, they'll develop tests that will look for the, um, the um, antibodies? of those, you know, to see if people have already had it and didn't realize that they had it at that time? I think that's probably a reasonable expectation. They're going to be pulling together a lot of data, yeah. uh, trying to get a handle for not just who has been infected, but uh, for those that have been uh, survived, what is their health state? How healthy are they? Have they had any uh, consistent health issues that are, are longer term than just the immediate term? And they'll want to know, uh, especially about, you know, do they have antibodies to it? Do they have an immunity to it? Uh, would they possibly uh, be reinfected? Those are all questions that they're going to start uh, under understanding here as time progresses. All right. One, one more question, then, then I'll let you go. And um, I, I really appreciate you sitting in with us, Jesse, on this. Um, Absolutely. So what fundamentally is the difference between this virus and the flu? the common cold, everything that we have circulating. I mean, you think about how many times you go to services and you didn't realize you were sick, let's say with the flu, and you probably gave it to half the congregation, okay? <clears throat> what is the fundamental difference between, hey, we everybody gets the flu and this new virus? Why can't we just kind of sit back and let it run its course like the flu does? Why? why well, what is the fundamental difference between this and the new one? If, if, if I'm asking so that right. I'll speak, yeah, I'll speak first to the flu. The, the flu is a virus that's been around for a very long time. All of us, regardless if we think we've had the flu or not, probably have somewhat uh, a little bit of an immunity to different strains of it. Uh, just by the course of time. It's a human virus that's been around for a long time. We've either been exposed to it or we've had uh, a vaccine, a vaccination against flu at some point. The problem with the COVID-19 is it's a brand new virus that's been found in humans. It's, we, we have no immunity to it. So everyone is potentially uh, able to become infected. 
Now, the range of symptoms is going to be completely dependent upon that person's immune system, how healthy they are, if they have any other comorbidities or, or other uh, health challenges associated with them. But everybody is going to be uh, able to be infected with this. So that's the, the, probably the major difference. Symptomology-wise, um, flu may be um, more vigorous uh, depending on the strain, but this has been a very nasty little virus. Uh, it's very easily spread and it's not as bad as the, the SARS virus that we saw a number of years back as far as lethality, but it is very, very nasty and they're seeing rates of, of mortality uh, anywhere from one to four percent, depending on the number of those that have been infected. I think that, I think that's the important point that, that you've made. This is new, and we're still learning about it. Um, it will, you know, if we jump forward three or four years, it's going to be no different, and jump for another, you know, ten years, it'll be around like everything else, and people will get it and they'll deal with it and so forth. They'll know how to vaccinate against it and things like that. But right now, it is completely new. And we have to um, we have to just be patient and let uh, let our professional people figure out what to do and how to deal with it. Um, and, and do you think it's possible? Okay, I said that was the last question a while ago, but one more question. That's okay. I'm here. <laughs> I'm just kind of thinking out loud because we'll we'll move on from this. Um, is there in the whole scheme of things? Could it be we've got people going to the hospital? who really don't need to, who will, if it's three years from now, we will know that if you'll just stay at home and do the necessary, drink your fluids and get plenty of rest and everything and your body will eventually. Is it, or do we have people going to the hospital that maybe if they just would isolate themselves would survive it? Or is it that, you know, teetering on life or death type situation? Well, in all reality, it's probably both. Okay. You probably have individuals who, if they did stay home and weathered the symptoms, they would be fine. But there's another cohort of, of individuals who need to be in, in that emergent care setting. They need yes. to have access uh, to oxygen, to ventilator systems, uh, to all the appropriate uh, medications and treatments that they may need to employ to, to keep those people alive. There are There's a, a number of people who have... Um, existing illnesses that make them very susceptible. So people that are immune compromised, people that have uh, hypertension, they're finding are, are more susceptible. Uh, there's just a number of things uh, that make uh, the virus that much nastier, that much uh, more difficult uh, to control and for our body's immune systems to fight. And you may not know, you, know, you may have a guy that's not been to the doctor much, doesn't realize he's suffering from hypertension doesn't really recognize the symptoms and he gets hits with this and it lays him out. Correct. You know, he's got to get, and there's the a number of people that, you know, yeah. even if they know they have it, they, they don't take care of themselves potentially either. Yeah. Um, you know, diabetes is a good example. It's a susceptibility factor for a lot of people. I and mean, we know a lot of people have uh, uncontrolled diabetes. Yeah. All righty, Jesse, I appreciate it. That's been very informative. And I just wanted to share with everybody kind of what you had told me and helped me to see that. Yes, it's, it is something that we definitely have to um, take. It's not that I was not taking it seriously. I just didn't quite understand. And you really helped me to understand it. So I appreciate that. You're welcome. All righty. Jesse, we will talk to you later now. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Right. Bye. -bye. Bye. Well, there you have it. And I think it's very, very informative. I know a lot of times when you've got the, the news and you're watching the news every day, you kind of get, get lost in, in all, the, um, all the noise that's going around. And they've got this person after this person. And, um, and they've got to fill 24 hours sometimes, you know, of, of information. But sometimes it helps to kind of focus down and ask a simple question and get an answer from it. And so I really appreciate Jesse being willing to do that for us tonight. All right, so what I would like for you to do, send me for tonight a couple of Bible verses, preferably not from Philippians 4. If you really want to, that's fine. All right, 
But send me some Bible verses that you find very inspirational, that you find are very helpful during these times of difficulties. And um, while you do that, I'll be calling up on my screen the psalm that we will be considering here in just a couple of minutes. You know, it, it, a couple of things we've learned tonight. We're not alone in this. Oklahoma's not alone in it. Indiana's not alone in it. The whole state is a whole country is going through this. And so the same decisions that we have to make, you know, here locally at, at various church congregations are having to be made throughout the whole country. The same decisions that families are having to make are having to be made by everybody. And, and, and not everybody makes the wisest of decisions. Um, Rhonda was telling me, and I, I don't have access to the news story, but apparently, um, some kids in either Virginia or West Virginia, somewhere like that, threw a COVID party where they all got together. And if I remember the story correctly, one of them uh, had been tested uh, to have been exposed to that. I mean, it's just, if that is true and, and, and accurate, it's just ridiculous because people need to recognize that we should watch out for one another and realize we're not alone in this. Um, we have people who are losing their jobs as a result of this um, and people whose lives are being put in danger, the nurses and the doctors and so forth. Um, it's just, it's one of those cases where we are all in this together as the expression close, uh, as expression goes and everything. And so we need to keep that in mind. Let's see. <clears throat> Looking over here at our, our comments here. Let's bring a couple of comments up here real quick on the screen. Mike, uh, Mike asks the question. Um, okay, my question <laughs> comment box disappeared. All right, I will find that and read that here. I'll bring it up in a minute, but here's what Mike says. Uh, when He asks about when we're done with the study. Is it possible for him to share it? And yes, I will be uploading... A recorded version of this to Facebook and also to YouTube as well. So um, we'll either have the leave the this live recording on Facebook, but I'll upload a, a good clean copy on YouTube, and you can definitely share this with whoever you would like. All right, let me tend to one local matter here real quick if I can do this somewhat speedily. Rhonda told me, in looking at this now, in the Facebook chat, that it is actually in Kentucky where the COVID-19 party took place that I was referencing. There in Kentucky. And that's just hard to imagine. It, it, it is uh, hard to believe that individuals would go and do that. But kids, at times, they are just... They don't always make the best decisions that they should make. All right, let's see. I think we've got another comment here we're going to bring into our chat room. There we go. All right, we've got that all fixed up here. Um, Rhonda also says, let's bring this up here too. She says, we're making the hard decisions because we love one another. And that's absolutely right. We are making the hard decisions because we love one another. Okay, so again, if you would like to... Kelvin, I don't think we fixed our issues <laughs> with that ticker. So I'll need to, I'll need to tackle that. We'll, we'll work on that later. And um, what it is, it's got a bunch of timers and stuff running, and they tend to overlap and everything. So send me your Bible verse that you would uh, like to have considered, that you want to share with us, one that you find is inspirational. All right, and looks like Kelvin is uh, indicating to me that we have also a couple comments that have been submitted through our messages, through our, our, our text messaging. And so these all need to read. I haven't yet fully incorporated, incorporated them yet. But Jared Dart says, do you think this virus will ever end or is this part of God's plan? It's bothering me not having regular services. At uh, Monte Vista, we only have one service now on Sunday morning. Jared, that is a very good question. And as to whether this virus will end, I don't think so. I think this virus is going to be in the, the, the be in our world. Now, they might develop a vaccine for it, 
so that we no longer have to deal with it. Think about the various things that have been vaccinated against. Think about polio. Think about the measles and, and, and things like that that have been brought under control with vaccinations. Um, some, some will kind of flare up when vaccinations aren't done, but you, we don't see them spreading throughout the country and there's a reason for that. Um, and so it'll probably always be around. We'll just, we'll, we'll, our bodies will learn to deal with it and everything. Or is this a part of God's plan? First off, I can't answer that question. I don't know the mind of God. Now, my personal opinion, and it's strictly opinion, is probably not. Um, Trust me, if God decided to punish the world, if he decided to bring Old Testament wrath and punishment onto this world, he would have done, he would have used something far greater than COVID-19. Um, and, but here's what you have to keep in mind. When you read the Old Testament prophecies, Jared, and, and, and you, you read, and, and you, you read about him talking about blights and, and diseases and things like that, those were used to punish his people, to turn the Israelites back around to him, or to punish other nations for their sins. Okay, Now, under the new covenant of Jesus Christ, the church is his holy nation. The church is his, his royal priesthood, his own chosen people, Peter tells us. And so now the body of Christ is Israel. It is a spiritual Israel, Paul kind of talks to us about. And so I really believe the judgment that's going to come upon the world is going to come when the day of judgment comes. But with that said, maybe God did do it. I just don't personally think so. And that, that's the way that I see it. And I could be wrong about that. Um, Brother Kevin Dow shares a verse with us, and so I'm going to bring that up on the screen over here. If you want to open your Bibles, we're going to go to the book of Matthew, and specifically to the sixth chapter of Matthew there in verse 33. And notice here, if you would, Matthew chapter 6 there in verse 33. When everything is said and done, we have all these worries on our shoulders. We've got a great heavy weight there. Remember this. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things, everything that you need to survive, everything you need to live, all of these things will be added unto you. God will take care of you. Keep that in mind. There's a song we sing in our songbook that has the phrase, He, you know, God will take care of you through all the day, and he continues on there. And there is the, the scriptural sentiment there the scriptural idea that God will provide for us. We also have another message that's coming in through text, and you'll see as it scrolls on the bottom of the screen there, the phone number. If you would like to send a message in, you can do that to 405-726-0874. But let me share with you the following text. It reminds us here of Psalms chapter 46, verse 1. Psalms chapter 46, verse 1. This is from Nona Carter. And let me bring it up on the screen so I can share it with you. Jumping over to the book of Psalms, you'll notice here in Psalms chapter 46 that the writer of the psalm writes the following. And we're going to say and attribute this to David, of course. God is our refuge and strength, the very present help in trouble. And then look what verse 2 says. Therefore, we will not fear. Even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, through though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling. You know, now we're dealing with a virus. Here we're dealing with this, this COVID-19 thing. But it could be something different. It could be an earthquake. It could be a typhoon. It could be a tsunami. It could be a tornado. There's so many things that we could face, and we need to learn to always trust in the Lord in all of those. And then Jesse. Hey, Jesse, you were just here a little bit ago. <laughs> he shares with us the following verse, and I think this is a good one to share. This will be found in John's first epistle, so, or not first epistle, but the first of his three letters. Let's go to 1 John. 
chapter 3, and I want you to notice there, beginning of verse 18, and we're going to read down through verse 23. Here's what John writes. My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence towards God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. That's, that, that kind of sums it up in, in, in a nutshell there, if you would, of our responsibility as Christians towards, to, or, towards other Christians, but also towards the people of the world. Also towards the people of the world. All right, let's see if we have any other comments that have come in from there. We have... Um, Kelvin, I appreciate you dropping that in. I missed seeing that while ago, so I'll kind of start watching for those as well. Jared Dart does say very directly that we do need to pray. And that's absolutely right. We do need to pray. All right, let me check on our time and get a drink of water here. And you can try to figure out the um, as the ticker continues to roll there, how you would like to participate in tonight's conversation. While we are waiting for other Bible verses to be shared, let me go ahead and share one with you at this time. Jared, I agree with that. I just He says, I just can't wait to get back to regular services. I agree completely. Uh, at Seminole Point, um, the congregation that I work with, we had initially picked the date of April 5th, giving at least the two-week period of time. But based on the, the governor's... Um, decree, the order, the what he has put into place, we will be waiting longer, it appears. And so we'll think more about that as we go through. All right. Let's take a moment and again, share your verses with me. Let's look at Psalms chapter 26. Psalms chapter 26. Last night we considered the 23rd Psalms, but tonight... I'd like to look at Psalm 26 for a few minutes. So the, the psalmist says here, Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my iniquity. I have always trusted in the Lord. I shall not slip. Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my mind and my heart. Now let's, and we'll read one more verse. For your loving kindness is before my eyes, and I have walked in your truth. You know, with David, there were a lot of things that David went through, and a lot of the things that he faced had to do with actual enemies, people who hurted him, who would hurt him. But here he begins by saying, Vindicate me, O Lord. Why? You know, when do we deserve vindication? Well, oftentimes, vindication is, is when you have been falsely accused of something. Um, let's say if you've been. Uh, arrested for, for something that you did not do, and then finally they find the evidence that proves your innocence, you feel vindicated in that. Well, here David says, vindicate me, Lord. Well, why? Why should the Lord vindicate David? Well, he says, for I have walked in my integrity. I have also trusted in the Lord. I shall not slip. All right, so David is saying, I have walked in the Lord. I have walked in my integrity. You know, maybe he was being charged of things. Maybe he was being accused of wrongdoing. And David says, no, vindicate me because I've walked in my integrity. And then he calls upon the Lord to examine him and to prove him, to try his mind and to try his heart. You know, I think it takes a lot of not self-righteousness, not that whatsoever, but honesty is the word I'm looking for. It takes a lot of honesty for us to be able to say, examine me, O Lord, and prove me, try my mind and my heart. If we are honest about it and we find ourselves not being able to make that statement and wanting it, I mean, think about it. If we are, if we are living in sin, do we really want to ask the Lord to try us, to try our minds, to try our hearts? Well, no, because we're not ready for that. 
But if we are walking properly in fellowship with him, then yes, we, we, we seek the, the Lord. We seek him to test us and to try us. Um, and if we find that we come up short, then we make the necessary changes. Let's look at verse 4. So he goes on to say, I have not sat with adulterous mortals, nor will I go in with hypocrites. I have hated the assembly of evildoers and will not sit with the wicked. I will wash my hands in innocence, so I will go about your altar, O Lord. David is declaring here before the, the people in this writing here that he has kept himself you know, free and clear, or, or, or not free and clear, sorry, clean. You know, and he has, he has made his decision not to be around those who, who do not serve the Lord. In Psalms 101, verse 3, he, will says, he says, I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. He, he hates the liars and the deceivers and the evildoers. And so he washes his hands, and notice what it says. He, I will wash my hands in innocence, so I will go about your altar, O Lord. You know, when we face the difficulties that we do today, we need to make certain that we focus on what is most important. Yes, we need to try to keep others safe. We understand that. We need to try to keep our families safe. We need to think of others before we think of ourselves. I, I realize that. But when we stop and consider what is most important, that still comes down to the health of our souls. And so we must continue to work. When we're not able to come together to worship the Lord, we must continue to work to make certain that we are still serving the Lord faithfully. Consider one more verse real quick of Psalms chapter 26, and then we've got some more comments in that I've received, and we'll check the chat room as well. There in verse 8, he goes on to say, Lord, I have loved the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. The idea there, the place where your glory dwells, when David wrote this, we've talked about this before, it is likely that the tabernacle is still being used, possibly in Jerusalem, uh, having originally been in Hebron, but may now in Jerusalem. But not yet, the, the temple had not yet been, been built. But the point is his presence, God's presence. So David says, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Same thing for us today. As children of God, um, we are to be walking in fellowship with God. We kind of talked about this, I think it was some last night, maybe the night before, the idea of our bodies being the temple of the Holy Spirit, walking in fellowship with Him. We should always recognize that we should strive to be in the presence of God. So let's bring in Romans chapter 8. This is what Chuck Carter shares with us. Romans chapter 8. We'll come back to Psalms 26 here in just a moment. Romans chapter 8 is a very popular passage because of the encouragement and the inspiration <clears throat> that Paul shared with the brethren in Rome that we can benefit from ourselves. Notice, Paul writes, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Well, shall tribulation or distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, or peril, or sword... As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long, we are counted as sheep for the slaughter, yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And then he writes, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is Christ Jesus our Lord. Not even the COVID-19 virus. <clears throat> this too shall pass. And the reason why we're doing the shelter in place is to ultimately the kindness towards others. Let's see. Jared Dart shares the following thought with us. He says, maybe you can do try doing just one service on Sunday mornings and have people spread around the auditorium. That's an idea. Some congregations have done that. What the problem is, even in that situation, there's still always the danger of you coming into contact or you not knowing you've come in contact with someone who has it, carrying it around and spreading, to, spreading it to others. Um, there's always the danger that is ran in that case in point. But Lord willing, we'll get past these days and hopefully, it, as Jesse pointed out, we'll get to a point with that curve there that they'll say, okay, guys, we can deal with this. 
let's resume our normal lives. That's what we're hoping for. All right, let's see. Any other comments? I don't think I see any at the moment. So let's go back and continue our reading here real quick of Psalms chapter 26. So as we continue in the psalm, David says, Do not gather my soul with sinners, nor my life with bloodthirsty men, in whose hands is a sinister scheme, and whose right hand is full of bribes. You know, you think about it. Shelter in place is the idea that we're going through in our country today. Who would you want to be quarantined with? You know, you hear about these people who went on cruises and they came back and they had to go into quarantine. I think I heard on the news today that finally a group of them that had been quarantined for so many days um, have finally been released. Who would you want to be quarantined with for 14 days? Well, I would think about my family because that's what I have here. But David, David said, you know, okay, I don't want to be with sinners with bloodthirsty men, with those who have sinister schemes, whose right hand is full of bribes, the, those who are deceitful. David didn't want to be with those individuals. He saw the dangers to that. But he says, but as for me, I will walk in my integrity. Redeem me and be merciful to me. My foot stands in an even place. In the congregations, I will bless the Lord. And so when we stop and think about our lives, we need to make sure that we are standing in an even place. We're not talking physical. You know, uh, back around in the late 80s, there's an earthquake hit California. And Ron and I were out there for this earthquake. I'm thinking it was 80, 89. Rhonda, you can correct me on that in the chat if you would. But I think it was 1989. We were in the San Francisco Bay Area. And um, we were shopping at, at a little shop there, and all of a sudden the ground started to shake. Really, it more felt like a giant had took the ground and, and just created ripples like you would with the bed sheet. It really felt like they were, it was doing this. And so Rhonda grabbed the buggies, or the strollers we had our two, two baby girls in at the time, and pushed them underneath the clothes rack, because these clothes would be there. And um, then it stopped. And there were a few things that had fallen off the ceiling, a couple of light fixtures, a few things off the shelf. And I'm thinking, you know, okay, as for a first earthquake, that wasn't too bad. And all of a sudden I'm hearing people say, that was a bad one. That was a terrible one. Rhonda was saying, that was, that was one of the worst ones we've had in a long time. And we went up to check out and, and you know, of course they had lost power for a little bit, but, but um, they were all talking about how bad it was. And I'm thinking, really? I don't see stuff all over the floor like you do in the movies. Until we walk past the store just adjacent, where the, uh, I'm, I'm assuming because of the way the aisles were laid out, everything was in the floor. And then we began to, it took us 40, it took us three hours, I think, to make a 45 trip back to her house. And um, the Bay Bridge had collapsed on itself. So you may go th through something like that. And it may wreak havoc for weeks after. But as a Christian, a child of God, we still have our foot on an even place. And that is in our trust in our Heavenly Father. And that's very, very important for us to remember. Um, it gives us strength. Got a couple more comments, and then we will bring this conversation to a close. Again, if you've got any thoughts you would like to share, feel free to do that. And maybe if something comes up at a later point in time, you can email me at questions at johnduval.net. You'll see that on the screen right now. You could email me at questions at johnduval.net, and I'd love to hear from you. If there's something you'd like to talk about, maybe a favorite Bible passage you would like to consider for inspiration, for encouragement, Share that with me, and I'll try to remember to make the time. We'll bring it into our discussion. In Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 17, Brother Jared Dart shares a comment about that. He, he pardon me, there we go. And yes, he has a message there. So let me read that. We're going to go over to, we won't read all of it for the sake of time. But this is a very good passage to keep in your pocket, to remember, to read, to study, especially beginning in verse 10. But I'll just read the first couple of verses for the emphasis here that they provide. He says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. 
Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And then notice verse 12. He says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of the sage, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. You know, think about it. He's kind of saying, we don't wrestle against viruses. We don't wrestle against bad neighbors. We don't wrestle against our bosses or our our employees, our co-workers. Our, we wrestle with things that are far greater. And ultimately, those things are trying to pull us away from God. And if we realize that, we can take a stance. And if we can stand up to those who are trying to pull us away from God, we definitely can take a stance against those of this physical earth who are trying to pull us away from God. We do truly need the whole armor of God. And I think that's a very, very important point to remember during these very difficult and trying times. Well, I think according to the clock, we have reached right at the top of the hour. And I'd like to thank you so much for joining me for this time of conversation. It's very important. We keep it going. We spend time talking. I know we have talked a good bit this evening about Sorry, we have talked a good bit this evening um, about the, the virus and things that were going on. And we won't discuss it every night. We may share some updates. But in the future uh, conversations we have, I'll try to bring in some other folks to share with us what's going on in their parts of the world. And they can talk to us a little bit about that. But again, but I want to hear from you. And be thinking about verses that inspire you, verses that help press, help you keep on keeping on as the expression goes. Remember, we're all in this together, and we are together, though apart. If you would, let us bow for a quick word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much for the life that you've given us. We pray, Heavenly Father, that those who have not yet accepted your word, we pray that, that something may be done or said that will help them to recognize their need for you. And we pray, dear Lord, they'll come to an understanding of the truth and choose to follow you. For all the faithful, dear Lord, we pray that you'll help to strengthen them and watch them as they go through this time period. We now pray, pray that you watch over those who are attending to those who are sick and watch over those who are also the ones who are the tenders who are watching over the sick ones. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. I appreciate the conversation with you. Have a wonderful evening.